this right here, this is our goal. This beast of a game was made way back in the prehistoric ages by a team of dinosaurs with super tiny arms and they couldn't even reach their keyboards. If they can do it, so can we. All right, nerds, let's dive into the nitty gritty of game development. Step one, well, it's simple, isn't it? Get to work. So I rolled up my sleeves and decided to tackle what seemed like a straightforward feature, creating sidewalks for our virtual pedestrians to tread upon. With my guests either wandering off aimlessly or refusing to move at all, I was at my wit's end. I was about to shut the park idea down for good. But wait, exclaimed a made up voice whom I created for this video. What if you built it in a way using Pathfinder to automatically trap users on sidewalks? And so that's what I did. And you might be wondering to yourself, or even aloud to your dog or cat, what a madman this win streak is. Could something like this even work? And with booming confidence, I would respond to you with, it works okay. So take this money back guarantee along with a customer support number that seems to have either too many or too few numbers to be real and get ready. Because soon you too can have a farm of little ant-like people wandering around on your sidewalks. All right, nerds, it's time to do some learning. Let's get started with the usual. We will add a tiled sprite of grass for the background, and we'll stretch that across our scene. And after the background, we'll have six different objects we'll need. And just as a quick disclaimer, we are using Pathfinder essentially the opposite of how it was intended. So the sizes of my objects played a large role in how well this worked. You don't have to follow my exact sizes, but the smaller the gap between the sidewalks and the player box, the worse my guests ended up navigating through the turns on the sidewalks. So with that being said, first we'll add an 8x8 sprite object, and we'll call this player box. And I'm going to give this a solid fill animation for testing purposes. But by the time we're complete, we'll end up hiding it so the image doesn't truly matter. And this player box will be used to guide where each guest actually is in the park. So we'll end up giving this the behavior of pathfinding. And we can keep everything as the default, except we will uncheck rotate object. Next, our sprite object for our player, which I'll grab something out of the asset store from RPG characters. And to keep this video straight to the point, we're just going to use a single animation of walking down and only a single character type from the asset store. So let's use edit with Piskel and change the size of our player object to 64 by 64 for the walk down animation. And then no behaviors or variables will be needed. We will also need a sprite object for our sidewalks. And I just created my own with a size of 64 by 64. And this was just a solid gray. It's not necessarily pretty, but it gets the point across. And our sidewalk is going to need two variables, both booleans with a default of false. One will be called walls added and the other sidewalk start. And we'll get to those later. And don't be like me and forget to name your objects as you bring them in. And since I forgot to, I will go back and do those now. Now we'll need a sprite object to represent our walls, which will be keeping the players on the path. Once the game is complete, these will be set to hidden. But again, for testing, I like to have some sort of visual image. And for this, I just make a large red X over a transparent background so they don't block up too much room. And this will be 64 by 64 as well. And this object will be the wall. So we need to add the behavior pathfinding obstacle, and we're going to want to make sure that impassable obstacle is checked. Next, we'll need a button object for building our paths. And I'm just going to throw this on the scene right away. And I will change the initial text to display and set it as build paths. And for our final sprite, we need something to represent where we're going to be adding new sidewalks. And this will also be 64 by 64. And I'll just do a minimal amount of white edges in a square in the center and leave the rest transparent so we can see what's behind it. Now let's go ahead and set up a grid. Clicking the toggle edit grid button on the top right, we will first choose set up grid and we'll want to set 64 width and 64 height and have a zero offset. We can apply those changes. 
Then click on that same button again, and this time we will set show grid. And now we can see our grid over our scene. And the last setting that we need is going to be in the project manager on the left side. And we're going to create or search for a new extension. And this extension is called rectangular grid when you're searching for it, but then shows up as snap to grid under your extensions. So don't get confused if the name looks different when you are setting it. And now that we have our grid, I want to go ahead and add a starting path. Something that will be the park entrance once you have everything set up. So this will start below your field of vision and come into the bottom of your scene. And I'm just going to add four different sidewalks walking straight up. Now that our scene is ready to go, we need to implement our walling system. Since we will be able to add new sidewalk mid game, this needs to happen dynamically. But wait, what's this? Yep, you guessed it. An amazingly edited animation thanking my members who were kind enough to help me fuel my coffee addiction for another month. How specific, yet accurate. Want to help out and have your name live on forever in my videos? Sign up with the link in the description. You are the real heroes. And to make this happen, we'll build a system that takes each sidewalk and surrounds it with walls on all eight sides. Additionally, to help out with performance, we'll make sure this happens only one time to each sidewalk. And finally, we'll have to build in a system that removes walls anytime a sidewalk touches them, as well as having a way to check if walls stack on each other and then removing one of those. This way, a sidewalk is always free and clear for people to walk on, but surrounded by walls on the outside, keeping the park goers safely inside the sidewalk. So, how would we go about tackling this? Well, we're going to want to grab every sidewalk, so we'll start out with a repeat for each instance of, and add our sidewalk object in there. And, to make sure we only do this once for each sidewalk, we will check that boolean variable, walls added, and make sure it's false. Since the default value is false, all of our sidewalks will start out with this variable set to false when they're created. And once this condition's met, the first thing we'll do is switch that walls added to true, and now we'll never check this sidewalk again. Then we'll go ahead and create eight walls relative to our sidewalk. Three on the right side, so plus 64 for the exposition. And we're going to want one above, one below, and one even compared to our sidewalk. Then we'll want one above and one below for the same exposition. And of course, we'll want to do the same thing for the left side, negative 64, as we did for the right. And here, we'll take a look at our preview, and we will see our walls surrounding our sidewalks, but also on top of our sidewalks. So we'll add a bit of code to check if the sidewalks are in collision with our walls. And we're going to make sure we set our ignore objects touching edges to yes, so the walls can be side by side. Then we simply delete the wall. Now in our preview, it looks right, but with four sidewalks, we should have a total of 14 walls. So this number means that we have several walls stacking on top of each other. And since extra objects means a worse performance, we will go back and add a way to delete the stacking walls. So our next condition will be very similar to our previous one, except before we were checking two different objects on collision. This time we are checking on two different instances of the same object. So delete wall here would delete both instances of the wall. Instead, we'll add an additional check, pick random wall, and this will pick one of the walls out of the two that were colliding. Now that our sidewalks are walled off, we're ready to implement the mechanic for building sidewalks during gameplay. Upon our button click, we'll toggle between the active and inactive states for building paths. To facilitate this, we'll introduce a global boolean variable called build paths, initialized with a default value of false. And in our events, a click on our button will simply toggle this boolean variable. Subsequently, depending on the state of the build paths, we'll either create or destroy our selector object. We're going to ensure this happens only once by checking if the count of selectors is zero and build path is true before creating a new one. And on the other side, the count should be equal to one while build path is false before we delete our selector. And then all the time if build path is true, we're going to continuously update the position of the selector object to match the cursor's position, snapping it to our grid using the snap to grid behavior. However, since the origin of our selector is at the top left of the sprite, there's going to be a slight offset. To address this, we're going to adjust the cursor position by subtracting half the selector's width 
from the x-coordinate and half the height from the y-coordinate. Now, to streamline the code even further, we'll go ahead and consolidate our two separate events that are both dependent on build paths being true. We'll create a parent condition with the less restrictive condition, responsible for running only the selector movement. Then, as a sub-event, we'll add the condition for the selector count being equal to zero, triggering the creation of our selector object. Continuing on within our newly combined event, we can introduce an additional sub-event, which operates independently of the first sub-event. Since this is a sub-event, it will still require the build paths to be true. And additionally, we'll add a new condition requiring the spacebar to be pressed to initiate building a new path. And then to restrict this condition even more, we're going to want to make sure there's not already a sidewalk at the position we're trying to build a new sidewalk. And we'll do that by checking on if our selector is colliding with a sidewalk. And again, we're going to ignore the edges here. And select invert, since we are checking to make sure they are not colliding. From here, let's create one more sub-event with no condition, because I only want the condition to be if build paths is true and that's provided from the parent. And for the action, I'm going to move the change position and snap actions for our selector. And our old code would have worked, but there'd be one frame where it's trying to move them before we actually create the selector. And this gets rid of that problem. Also while doing this, I notice my cursor X and Y positions were not set to half the width and height. So I'm also going to update those now. And with these changes, we can now create as many sidewalks as we want and our walling system still holds true. Now, to initiate the spawning of our people, we'll set up a single condition to force their entry into the park. This will be triggered on a key press, namely the Z key. Additionally, we'll perform a boolean check on the sidewalk to ensure that our sidewalk start variable is set to true. Spoiler alert, it's not. So, to rectify this, we'll need to set only one instance of our sidewalk objects to have their sidewalk start value set to true. Specifically, this will be the bottom one. Back in our events, instead of directly spawning our actual players, we'll first create a player box, hide it, then create our player at the position of the player box's X and Y coordinates. We'll then link them together, facilitating an association between the player and the respective box. Our next event will be repeated for each instance of player box. With that said, inside of a sub-event, we'll have no condition We'll want to take into account all players linked to their respective player boxes and change their positions accordingly. In another sub-event, if no path is found for our player box, we'll randomly select a sidewalk and move our player box to the center X and Y position. Now to ensure our players appear on the sidewalk, we'll need to adjust their origin. Go into the player object and move the origin somewhere near the center of their feet. Finally, we'll add one more event to check if the player box has reached its destination. If so, we'll pick a new random sidewalk and move the player there, repeating the process. Now with this setup, we'll have endless parkgoers walking around our sidewalks. On my end, just for testing purposes, I've added a zoom out feature in two counters. The top one displays the number of players in the park, and the bottom one shows the frames per second. And as we mash in new players, we can see the frames per second do slowly decrease, and we can add thousands of players if we want to, but you can see the frames per second do start to drop, and eventually it will become unplayable. So as long as your maximum players is somewhere in the 500 to 1000 range, it doesn't seem that bad. But I wouldn't think we would want to do anything too far above that.